Hey everyone, welcome to the Peter Atia Drive. I'm your host, Peter Atia. The drive is a result of my hunger for optimizing performance, health, longevity, critical thinking, along with a few other obsessions along the way. I've spent the last several years working with some of the most successful top performing individuals in the world. And this podcast is my attempt to synthesize what I've learned along the way to help you live a higher quality, more fulfilling life. If you enjoy this podcast, you can find more information on today's episode and other topics at peteratiamd.com. Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode two of five in the week of day spring. This episode, we cover lipoprotein basics. What's lipoproteins and lipids 101? We talk about Goffman and the ultra centrifuge and how we came up with these whole ideas of densities of lipoproteins. We get into very specifics around the lipoprotein structure, their function, and their metabolism. We talk about how to measure the lipoprotein and the cholesterol content and what NMR is and how it has changed the game a little bit. We get into the distinctions between LDL cholesterol, LDL particle number, and ApoB. There is some confusion here amongst physicians and presumably amongst patients, so hopefully that will clear that up. We get into the biochemistry of lipids, and then we talk about sterols specifically as a more broad category. Now, before we could measure anything to do with lipoproteins, if my memory serves me correctly, it would have been the late 40s, very early 50s, when the first assays were developed, maybe it was 1951, that could actually just measure total cholesterol. So you would take plasma from a patient, you would presumably in an assay break down all of the lipoproteins and just aggregate the total amount of cholesterol, and you would yield that number, which still amazingly shows up on a panel today. You go and get a blood test, and it might say your total cholesterol is 200 milligrams per deciliter. So that, that was, am I correct? That was the early 50s, maybe? Uh, no, I think they were analyzing cholesterol long before that, because that that's a molecule. You can take blood and dissolve whatever you got to dissolve, and cholesterol appears. So they had cholesterol measurements for a long, long time. It's like the first lipid anybody yeah. could ever measure. What you're talking about in the 50s is where John Hoffman discovered that hey, wait a minute, there are no lipids floating around in plasma because lipids are incredibly hydrophobic. Your plasma is water. You can't have lipids circulating in plasma. So lipids obviously have to be within what I call water-soluble lipid transportation vehicles, and that turns out, of course, to be a lipoprotein, a, a protein-wrapped collection of hydrophobic and amphipathic uh, lipids that just wouldn't be in your plasma unless they're attached to a protein. Peter mentioned albumin. It's a protein. So lipids can attach to albumin and be circulated around and uh, other type proteins, but albumin is the most frequent protein in the blood. So it serves as a carrier. I think an albumin can carry like 17 molecules of cholesterol, a few of phospholipids too. So it's, it's a player out there. we got a ton of albumin in our plasmas. You'd be shocked to find out how much cholesterol is in it. Not quite as much as in life. Albumin's kind of an amazing protein. Well, it'll carry hormones. Yeah. It'll carry just about anything. Yeah. It's remarkable. And, and it has everything to do with osmotic pressures and things like that. So albumin is a, kind of an essential little protein, to say the least, performing many, many functions. But... When John Hoffman, a physicist, by the way, who had physicists have been playing with ultra centrifuges for a long time, separating their radioactive particles and stuff, he somehow wound up separating lipoproteins or saw things floating around in a centrifuge <laughs> test tube that he then identified as the lipoproteins. So if you learn nothing else today, learn the first thing is lipids, for the most part, go nowhere in the human body unless they're a passenger inside a lipoprotein. So if you believe there are a lot of lipid-associated diseases, and I certainly believe atherosclerosis, it's you cannot have atherosclerosis without a sterol, a lipid, being in your arterial wall. And I know that artery, arterial wall didn't oversynthesize sterols, creating a sterol buildup. Somebody had to deliver those sterols there, and that, of course, turns out to be a lipoprotein. And one of the places a lipoprotein should never deliver sterols to, to any serious degree, of course, is your arterial wall intima. So being a Jersey guy, one of my standard jokes on a lecture circuit was atherosclerosis is just a 
evidence of illegal dumping where a lipoprotein, instead of bringing lipids to wherever it's supposed to be bringing, it was bringing sterols to the arterial wall. And over decades, you got a problem. You, you know, it could do it for a few days, six months. You're not going to die of atherosclerotic disease. So, so when did it become clear? So Hoffman figures out by first principles, basically, he imputes that there's got to be something that is transporting this very, very hydrophobic molecule through plasma. It doesn't, you know, I mean, it's in, it's easy in retrospect to make light of what an observation that is, but the next observation would be it would need to be spherical, right? I mean, it's it's to optimize the volume in which you could transport, Correct, yeah. it would have to be spherical. You're a mathematician, a volume of the sphere, yeah. the third power of the radius. So if you're going to devise a transportation vehicle, a That's sphere is better the than most, a flatbed truck, yeah. you know? So how long was it until... I mean, I know the answer to this question, but I just have to sort of tee it up. Who then went on to figure out these things occur in different densities? It's not just one. There's not just one spherical molecule that's transporting these things. Because this is a beautiful story, yeah, right? It was Hoffman. He noticed that there, and they weren't calling them APO B and APO A1 right, right. particles at the day, but they were different densities. They were gigantic. So explain what you mean by density, because this term, you know, we talk, everyone knows low density light proton, high density light proton, but tell me what, where that terminology actually came from. Well, I think it has to do with water has a certain density, so it's whether things float in water or sink in water. We know rocks sink if we throw it in a pond, so they're very dense things, whereas other things float on top of water. They obviously are less dense than water is, so everything is relative to water there. So if you establish what you think is the density of water, things that float. So when he separated these things in a centrifuge, the lipoproteins or these fat balls that didn't move at all were obviously very buoyant. Some sunk just a little bit, so they were less buoyant, but still pretty buoyant, and some went right to the bottom of the test tube, obviously incredibly dense. And it turns out what makes a, a lipoprotein buoyant is a ratio of its lipid fat content, because I think we all know fat floats on water, or if proteins, check out the molecular weights of proteins, really heavy, they sink. So they're the rocks. So your density of a specific particle here, a lipoprotein particle, is going to be related to its lipid content versus its protein content. So our big monsters that are delivering, as I told you, triglycerides, but have a lot of phospholipids on our thing, they have some proteins, but they have so much lipids, they float. They're the buoyant ones. And as they lose the lipids, they become smaller. Now, they lo might lose a few proteins as they shrink, but they're really using the, the lipids. But they're fundamentally concentrating protein as they get – I mean, because when, yes. when you go from chylomicron, even though they're not the same lineage, so I want to be very careful, you'll explain this in detail – you do not go from a Kyler micron to a VLDL to an IDL to an LDL to an HDL. No. They're three separate lineages I just described. But in size, they loosely track as the smaller they get, the more they've concentrated protein. Within every category of lipoproteins, be you talk Kyler microns, which intestinally produce VLDLs, hepatic produce, and the classic teaching is as VLDLs become smaller, you call them intermediate density and low density. We now know the liver can... Produce Make an each LDL of those. Yeah. without making a VLDL first. High densities, which form themselves in the uh, thing, sort of go the opposite way, whereas the VLDLs and chylos come out as big fat monsters and lose lipids and become smaller and denser. The HDL, as it gathers lipids, becomes bigger and more buoyant. But within every class of lipoproteins, you're going to have a heterogeneous range of densities from big species to small species. And this is why, to me, I like to tease because you always hear people talk about the small, dense LDL. Within every lipoprotein classification, the smaller particle is always more dense than the... So that's a redundancy. It's a redundancy. Say, just tell me dense LDL. Just say small LDL. I know it has to be dense, or if it's dense, I know it has to be small compared to its sister particles within that family or so. Somehow small has only been applied more frequently to LDLs because that's the killer one or HDLs. Oh, my God, you want to have the big HDLs. Another joke that's turned out, but for a longest while, oh, if you don't have big HDLs, you're in big trouble or so. And if you've got the small LDLs, you're in the biggest trouble. 
that basically turns out to be because if you have small LDLs, you need a ton of them to carry whatever your lipid load is. So you got a super high LDL particle concentration if you have small LDLs, and that's more related to its pathology per se than the size. Not that that won't cause certain functional characteristics of the LDL. But the VLDL, the chylos come out big and they shrink. Now, the reason, though, that differentiate chylomicrons and the VLDLs, IDLs, and LDLs is they have a lot of apoproteins on their surface, which they do lose as they shrink. But there's one protein they never lose, and it's the one that has the most massive molecular weight, apolipoprotein B. So that's why they are never going to be as dense as an HDL particle because an HDL has, doesn't have this monstrosity high molecular weight apo B on it. It's got other things, far less lipids. But to some, the, the LDLs, IDLs, VLDs are always going to be way more buoyant because, of, because they do have a little bit of an anchor on them, creating to their density is that ApoB. And it's the only, as you study ApoProteins, there are probably up to 20 to 30 of them now, all of which have certain functions that it sort of directs a lipoprotein down which path it's going, a catabolic path. The only ApoProtein... By the way, get definitions out the way, apoprotein, apolipoprotein, lipoprotein. An apoprotein is the protein your cell makes. Once it binds to lipids, it's called an apolipoprotein. And of course, the whole particle itself is called the lipoprotein. So let me re-synthesize that. The lipoprotein is the spherical structure whose membrane is made up of mostly these phospholipids, but also other lipids. The apoprotein is the thing that kind of gives it its signature. So, for example, the chylomicron has a B48, the IDL, VLDL, and LDL have a B100, etc. That's just called the apoprotein. It's once the apoprotein, and I assume it's covalently bound to the lipoprotein, that becomes the apolipoprotein. And we short, we abbreviate that apo fill in the blank. Yeah. So if I took a VLDL particle, and later on I'll tell you, boy, on a VLDL you're going to find APOC1, APOC2, APOC3, APOA5, and a bunch, including APOB, but it's going to lose everything but APOB as it sort mm-hmm. of shrinks or lose most of the other ones because they're transferable. They can jump on a different lipoprotein if they so desire. The APOB never does. For a bunch of reasons, it provides the structural integrity to that particle throughout its existence. But ApoB turns out to be the ligand for receptors that internalize those particles when you, the, your body don't need them anymore. So the LDL receptor that everybody so knows So the about. ligand, just for because there's some, some people listening, it's like the key that fits into the lock. If the receptor is the lock, the ligand is the key. And in biology, that's sort of how everything works. The key has to fit the lock. Correct. And if it didn't, then that lipoprotein is going to stay in your plasma and probably wind up going somewhere It's where it's going to create a pathological So, so when state. was it figured out that apolipoproteins are going to come and go there's one of these ones that not only always stays, but you have one. Because <laughs> that's a big deal. The realization that ApoB100, if you knew that concentration, you had a proxy for how many particles you had. Yeah. So Goffman certainly figured out there were proteins involved here, but he wasn't applying that nomenclature to them and everything. It's guys who further, a few years further down the road, uh, Fredericks and Levy and Lees, so we've to, we've to, talked about those with Ron Krauss. Realize and, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are, these are really there are some very important structural and functional proteins on these particles that we better start investigating and giving names to. So their research led to the identification of them, and ultimately, I mean, we know now the amino acid breakdown of every darn. Uh, apoprotein that's in our body or on our particles and everything. So it just, when one researcher invents a little bit of the story, other ones pick up the pieces and start further elaborating on it with different studies and technology improves and some of these things that were not assailable at one point become that you can measure them and identify their structure and everything. So it's one of these evolutionary things. And and it just made such perfect sense, too, because we knew these particles are changing, so they're undergoing catabolic processes. Why? What's doing that? And then all of a sudden you figure out that these 
ligands, these apoproteins, are keys to various receptors. Some of those receptors pull the particle next to where there's an expression of a lipid-dissolving enzyme, a lipase, and it starts to all make perfect sense to you. So over time, we've identified numerous of these enzymes that can catabolize lipoproteins, numerous of the receptors that temporarily bind these particles in place so they can undergo this thing, ligands that lipidate, fill the particles with the lipids or delipidate them. So So if you're listening to this and you're confused at this point, it's okay. One, there's going to be killer show notes, but more importantly, we're going to take a step back now. I'm a guy listening to this. I'm a girl listening to this. All I know is every time I go to the doctor, he or she gets a blood test and it spits out the following total cholesterol equals this LDL. And they won't even let's it'll be worse. It'll say LDL equals this HDL equals this triglyceride equals this. And maybe it will say non HDL equals this. What do those things mean in relation to everything you just said? Yeah. First of all, the misinformation on Labeling lipid metrics is one of the things that Miracle hasn't given me a stroke yet. I do a lot of peer review. I'm going to, I want the associate editor. That's why we're fasting you, Tom. Journal of Clinical Lipidology, and I will reject a paper instantly that uses improper lipid metrics. Don't tell me you're, the LDL is this because LDL is a low density lipoprotein. It's not a laboratory metric. You want to tell me what the LDL cholesterol is, the LDL particle number is, the lipidomics of an LDL is the LDL oxidized or not? Great. We do have assays that will measure that. So let's please all you, don't identify yourself as an ignoramus. And like I've told this to many of the top lipidologists in the country who lecture, stop telling people what's your LDL. Ask them, what is your LDL cholesterol? What's your, if we don't all talk the talk, you're never going to understand the process. So this patient almost assuredly is talking about total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, and non-HDL cholesterol. Yeah. So I'll give you a quick, and by the way, Peter did mention something very quickly before I just wanted to expound. He talked about, hey, ApoB 100, ApoB 48. ApoB is a giant structural non-transferable apoprotein that's on chylomicrons or VLDLs. The intestinal machinery that synthesizes a chylomicron makes a certain type of ApoB, and the ApoB that is made in the liver makes a much bigger ApoB. It has a higher molecular weight. So they knew the ApoB that's being made in the intestine is much smaller. So it turns out to be that the ApoB in the intestine is 48% of the molecular molecular weight weight of the hepatic produced ApoB. If you get into genetic ApoB, you'll see ApoB 31, that has 31% of the molecular weight of what's considered a normal ApoB. So when you hear ApoB 48, that should identify it as an intestinally produced ApoB particle, and a liver would be an ApoB 48. And LDLs that come out of the liver have, no, excuse, have ApoB100 on it, like the VLDL, or a VLDL, it becomes an LDL, the ApoB100 is still there. Or so so just keep, if you hear 100 or 48, what does that mean? It sort of tells us the origin. We are going to be talking about nuclear magnetic resonance, and one of the parameters they used to give you a lot on, less so nowadays, is VLDL particle concentration. When you analyze a lipoprotein using nuclear magnetic resonance, it cannot tell the difference between a chylomicron and a VLDL because NMR doesn't measure the proteins. It's, hey, that's a very big particle, so it has to be a VLDL or chylose. Most of your big particles but if you're are VLDLs. Yeah, and even in a postprandial state, chylomicrons have half-lives in minutes. They're gone. So the vast majority of VLDL particle number via NMR is still VLDL CLDL. particle, but there could be some chylose. All right, but I want to go back to yeah. our lady. So. Right. Her total cholesterol is 190 milligrams per deciliter. So total cholesterol, remember my premise that lipids go nowhere in the body unless they're within a lipoprotein. It's not exactly true, but for today's purposes, that is true. And certainly understanding lipid metrics, that's true. So total cholesterol would be the laboratory has uh, separated all your lipoproteins from the serum and they're take how much cholesterol is in this serum tube. So where would that cholesterol be that they're analyzing? Well, it would be found in, if there were any chylomicrons there that were hanging around, or maybe they didn't fast, some of it would be chylomicron cholesterol. 
some of it would certainly be VLDL cholesterol, a lesser amount because there's just so many, so fewer of them would be intermediate density cholesterol particles. And the rest would be in either LDL particles, low density lipoproteins, or the high density lipoproteins. There are other types of LDL particles called LP little a, which we'll talk about. So total cholesterol is all of the cholesterol. It is in every single lipoprotein that's in a deciliter of your plasma. And that is directly measured. It is it, not it's imputed. Assay. That is not a calculation. That is assayed. So it's any, there's always a coefficient of variability. That's inaccurate. And so if you want to use cholesterol for anything nowadays, because let's face it, that was the first parameter looked at in the epidemic, and they certainly correlated total cholesterol levels with the risk for heart disease. But think about what I just told you. It's the cholesterol within all the lipoproteins. What is the, if you count it particles, what is the most numerous particle in your bloodstream? The ApoB particles. Well, actually, the HDLs are more, but they're so small, they don't carry much cholesterol. So most of your, if you want to put a parenthesis around it, atherogenic cholesterol would be within your ApoB particle. So if you want to ascribe any use to total cholesterol, it's a real poor man's ApoB level. In general, most people with very high total cholesterol levels will have a very high ApoB level on there. And that's the real reason they're at risk for atherosclerosis, because those are the particles. Yeah, I mean, the original epidemiology basically said, you know, you have to sort of applaud them for doing the best they could with the tools they had. But let's take total cholesterol, which is at the time the only thing we could measure clinically. Let's take the patients who were in the top 5% and the patients in the bottom 5%. Was there a difference in their risk of MI? And the answer was yes. Correct. Now, it would be another at least decade until Framingham. This is kind of an interesting story, right? How it got this, this part of the story got ignored in Framingham was that low HDL cholesterol and high triglyceride turned out to be four times more predictive of MI than high LDL cholesterol. And again, this is still crude measurements, but that, that sort of didn't come back into. People didn't come back to try to explain why that might be the case until Jerry Reven had sort of done his work on metabolic syndrome. But I also realize I'm going to get us off topic. I want to go back to this other question. So we've just explained what 190 milligrams per deciliter means. When it says HDL, it really means HDL cholesterol as evidenced by the units. So those will either be measured in millimole or milligrams per deciliter. That's a direct assay or an indirect assay? Yeah. So Framing, who, of course, did measure total cholesterol, was easily available, he did it. They measure triglycerides too, although they really had no clue what they where they related to us, but it was measurable. Glycerides, they called it glycerides back then. And they did have a direct assay for HDL cholesterol. They you know, you could also measure and you know, you can centrifuge particles, you can take out the LDL fraction and analyze how much cholesterol is in them. That's theoretically the gold standard, you can separate the HDL product, but that's too time consuming. Nobody's got ultra centrifuges. So to have real world tests, chemists had to develop direct assays. So HDL assays were developed real early on. So Framingham could not only measure total cholesterol, they could measure, directly measure, not calculate HDL cholesterol. What they could not measure, and it took a long time, was LDL cholesterol. There without was, entris- without uh, ultracentrifugation. Without ultracentrifugation, correct. In the 70s, somebody came up with a formula that here's a way of at least estimating or calculating LDLC, which took fire because by the 70s, they realized the most numerous atherogenic lipoprotein were the low-density lipoprotein. So as Framingham started calculating LDL cholesterol, they, whoa, this is the story here. So they calculate. So just to be clear, well. what they're doing is they're directly measuring total cholesterol because you can just do that off serum. They precipitate out the HDL, right? So you yep. could measure the HDL without ultracentrifugation, and you could measure triglycerides. So now the formula for estimating LDL cholesterol became total cholesterol minus HDL cholesterol 
minus triglycerides over five. Why the triglycerides over five? Yeah. So Frida Wall put two and two together and realized, hey, total cholesterol is in essence VLDL cholesterol plus LDL cholesterol plus HDL cholesterol. A equals B plus C plus D. So if I know parameter A and I know parameter D and I know parameters, say I can figure out what parameter and, C and, is. And so what, what he did was he said, I'm going to ignore chylomicron and IDL and LP little a. Well, LP little a was at that point probably being not even, it was being included in the LDL. Yeah. They were basically counted as, yeah. the chylos are counted as VLDLs and the IDL is counted as LDL. Yeah. Okay. So therefore, if I know the HDL cholesterol and I know the total cholesterol, if I only knew VLDL cholesterol, I could easily calculate what your LDL cholesterol was. So then it becomes, uh, you have to know what is a VLDL particle. And at least if you have a physiologically normal VLDL particle, most of those lipids are in the core of the particle. There are no triglycerides on the surface, no cholesterol ester on the surface. If I only knew the composition of these particles, I could figure out. So they came to the realization that, on average, a physio, at least in the 1970s, a VLDL particle composition had five times more triglyceride than it did cholesterol. And virtually in a fasting state, all of the triglycerides, they're not in an HDL, they're not in an LDL. We're not measuring chylomicrons because they're, they're in a VLDL. So cholesterol in a VLDL has to be triglycerides divided by five because there's one fifth as much cholesterol in a VLDL particle as there. So VLDL cholesterol is triglycerides divided by five. So now if I have HDL cholesterol, VLDL cholesterol, total cholesterol, you do the math. You're a mathematician, Peter. It's very easy to, aha, this is what your LDL cholesterol is. And as they calculated that and they applied it to clinical trial data, correlations are very, very good. And they knew that's probably where the money is because of our ApoB particles, the particles are, that are the ones delivering these sterols to the artery wall, the overwhelming majority of them, 95%, at the lowest end, 90% are LDL particles. It's where the money is. We need a metric of LDL, and the calculated LDLC was earliest introduction to that. Now, down the road, people have developed direct assays of LDL cholesterol. But you know what? Turns out it's not that much more accurate than the calculated VLDL cholesterol, unless as you start to go up, up, up in triglycerides, that calculation falters. So, which is something we're seeing more and more of today. Yeah. And, and the than, original than, than we saw in the original Framingham. Dad, who said, "Oh boy, if your triglycerides get above four hundred, don't use that calculation. It's ridiculous." So they actually developed a direct LDLC to give us a, an LDL cholesterol metric in people with triglycerides of 800, 1200, 4000, where now you know what their LDL cholesterol is, whereas the formula would be useless there. We now know that formula starts to become kind of erroneous at somewhere between a trigger 150 and 200, and the higher you go above 200, be careful with a calculated LDL cholesterol, and rely on direct LDLC. But and here's what nobody realizes. The only value that calculated or directly measured LDL cholesterol brings to the table is it's a better poor man's estimate of your LDL particle concentration than is total cholesterol. So an LDL cholesterol would correlate better with ApoB or LDL particle concentration than would a total cholesterol. Down the road a little bit, we've come to the realization that if we get another calculation called non-HDL cholesterol, that even better correlates with ApoB or LDL particle concentration than does LDL cholesterol. So that's why that's the new thing that's in vogue. We also, thanks to your, I know you spent a little time down in Hopkins. Some of the lipid guys down there have invented a much better calculated LDL cholesterol, which they're trying to get incorporated rather than the older calculation, the, the Frida Wald that uh, uh, we've been using forever and most labs entirely use nowadays or so. So NMR, which is, you know, my first exposure to NMR was in high school when we were taking organic chemistry and you learned that we had these tests. I still remember how fun these tests were where they would show you an NMR spectroscopy and you had to figure out what the molecule was by knowing where those spikes were. 
So was Jim Otvos the guy that first figured out that you could use that stuff to actually count the number of these APOBs? Yeah, I think Otvos was certainly one of the early pioneers and uh, over father time, the, the real pioneer who evaluated lipids and lipoproteins using nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. He knew that lipids would emit specific spectral signals that he could analyze and through very complex mathematics, turn them into a variety of lipoprotein metrics, including you can do an NMR LDL cholesterol level and LDL triglyceride level. In the future, that's one of the ways we're going to be measuring phospholipids on various lipoproteins is NMR spectroscopy. Because as Peter says, every lipid has a different spectral signal. And if you know what you're doing, you can look at a spectral signal and know what it's molecular composition is and everything. So Jim turned it into, you know, as we had all these lipid metrics that we're talking about, cholesterol, even triglyceride metrics, deep down the guys know these are just poor man's way, easily assayable ways of quantifying lipoproteins. And it's the quantification that matters in many cases or so. So we have to it turns out in the long run, it's the, the number of ApoB particles that primarily is what forces it into the artery wall. Very little else. I mean, there are other factors, but that's the number. But one when factor. was that? When was that pathophysiology first stumbled upon that it even mattered how many of these particles you have versus? So let's just take out the estimates and let's assume that you have the ability to measure the total cholesterol concentration within an LDL particle, which is what's showing up when someone gets a blood test and it says direct. When it says LDLC direct, that means they've actually measured it. So now it's better than Friederwald's estimation. But that's different from if you have an NMR where it says LDLP nanomole per liter. And that's counting the number of those particles. So one is the number of particles, the other is the amount of cholesterol contained within them. We'll, we'll get to what a revisiting of Mesa and Framingham made unambiguously clear, which is one of those predicts better than the other. But was that really the realization that it was a gradient driven process by number? Or was that understood beforehand, or at least hypothesized beforehand, and then more more verified by the experimental evidence? No, early on, they discovered it was the ApoB particles going into the artery wall and delivering these sterols and everything that set off this maladaptive inflammatory process that led to a whole other area of investigation or so. So uh, the particle number data came once they sort of identified a way of assaying particle numbers, and they almost evolved as this. Maybe ApoB came a little bit first, but then Jim Obfos's work on LDL particles came at the same time, and it clearly became evidence that ApoB is a better risk factor. And remember, there is one ApoB on every VLDL, IDL, and LDL, but 95% of the ApoB particles are LDL, so ApoB is just a way for the labs to report to you what an LDL particle concentration is. Opfos identified an LDL particle concentration using these methyl signals coming out of the, the methyl groups that are on cholesterol, ester, and triglycerides, and phospholipids, and translated into a particle number that, wow, either ApoB or LDL particle number correlates a lot better with clinical events or the presence of atherosclerosis. You haven't had an event, but if we do some imaging, we see plaque in your wall. Then does the cholesterol measurement per self. So it's not a surrogate of particle. They are particle measurements, ApoB or LDLP. So ApoB is an LDL particle metric. What too many people get lost at, hey, VLDL particles are an ApoB particle, so VLDLs are part, and there's no doubt that VLDLs can get in the artery wall and contribute to it, but it's like a minor, the number of VLDLs that get into the artery wall are infinitesimal, the number of kylos that get in are infinitesimal compared to the number of LDL particles, so yet are all bad guys, they, and a VLDL per particle have significantly more cholesterol molecules in it than an LDL 
but there are just so many more LDLs that collectively the LDLs deliver more cholesterol to that artery wall. Oh, I want to go back but and an do APOB, one more. But an APOB, by the way, gives us no information on VLDLs. It's an LDL particle metric. You can't use it for anything else. So don't call me up and say my APOB is high because I got too many VLDL particles unless you have a rare lipid disorder where there are no LDL particles, the type 3, this beta lipoproteinemia. That's the only time an APOB is measuring. It's a VLDL measurement or a remnant measurement. It's not an LDL measurement. But in everybody else, APOB, LDLP, those are the tests you need. Because although they correlate very well with LDL cholesterol, if they're both high in a given person, that person's at terrible risk. But as you well know, and probably because of the metabolic makeup of our existing humans, at least throughout the world now, is some people have a very high ApoB LDLP, very good LDL cholesterol. Some people have high LDL cholesterol, perfect ApoB LDL particle counts. When those metrics agree, they're said to be concordant. Hey, use them both. Either one will give you the same information. But what happens if you get a patient where they don't agree these metrics in virtually every single trial ever looked at? The risk follows the particle metric more than the cholesterol metric. So the only way to know who is discordant with a cholesterol metric and an ApoB or an LDL particle metric is to do both of them. You could also well, say, hey, if I'm just doing ApoB or an LDL particle count, I don't even need lipids. And I'd agree with you, except I think there is value in knowing what a triglyceride is for other reasons. So... Uh, that's the real key. And if you ever go to a doctor and you're told, I'm very happy because your LDL cholesterol is normal, say, well, so am I, doc. But by the way, what was the ApoB or LDL particle count? And if the doctor didn't do it, you demand you do it instantly because otherwise you don't know your lipid-related risk. Yeah, we're going to upset a lot of doctors here because I've already, and you've already been in the business of that, where people will hear you talk or something or read something you've written or something I've written and they'll go to their doctor and say, Hey, I want my LDLP or my APOB. And the doctor says, that's nonsense. You know, fill in the blank, TBD, blah, 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 blah. And it puts patients in an awkward position. I mean, I really feel bad about this because especially on, depending on what country they live in, at least in the United States, I think anybody can go to LabCorp directly and get the assay without a physician's prescription. But it upsets me. I think the patients even have to do that. It upsets me that something that is such an important metric, I would list LDLP as one of the five most important metrics. I've talked about this, that every patient should know their LDLP or APOB and that that wouldn't be sort of fundamentally a part of screening somebody for disease and that a patient would get into a position where they're having to argue with their doc about that is, is disconcerting. And look, hopefully this is sort of why I do these podcasts is I think it's just as much to help physicians say, look, just because I didn't learn this in my training doesn't mean I don't need to sort of pick it up today. Amen. And I'm sad there's so much what I consider inferior lipid care being administered by healthcare professionals in the United States, but there's nothing I can do about that is try and teach them one at a time or expose my writings and other people's writings and the data on this as much as I can. And uh, is tragic with public health problem number one or number two that this has lagged so far behind, in part retarded by guidelines and uh, third-party payers who just don't want to pay for different metrics and stuff. So there's other reasons behind it. But a big part is they don't understand it. You have had cardiologists call you up. I have had, being recognized as maybe in northern New Jersey, one of the, hey, hey, hey Tom, you know, you, you told my patient that, uh, you know, what I said about LDL cholesterol doesn't matter because you've done an LDL particle. And you, put, you know, not everybody believes that or they give you some horse shit like that. And I said, I'm going to identify, hey, doctor, would you like 200 manuscripts delivered to your desktop tomorrow? I'll do it if you promise me you'll read them every <laughs> single one. So, you know, it is what it is. I think the internet is help people in certain ways. I think the internet has confused people in a lot of ways too, because there are people out there who, what we just talked about, and it's pretty much fact, who become deniers of the particle concentrations because whatever else they're exposing as their way to cure heart disease somehow aggravates LDL particle count, and they just choose to ignore it. 
And look, are there people with high LDL particle counts who don't somehow? Yeah, they're out there. But the overwhelming amount of literature says the odds over if you keep this for 20, 30 years, you're going down. You Until somebody does a serious study showing there are people who can escape this for 20. You're playing with fire to ignore an elevated LDL particle count APOB. I don't have a way of identifying who who might have a high metric there is somehow protected against atherosclerosis. Well, I have lots of thoughts on this myself, but and maybe we'll come back to it. But I and and I think we've gone back and forth. Uh, we had this fun email string a, a, a while ago with you, Ron, me, Alan. I think Josh Knowles was on it as well. Where we just you guys were the first people to be exposed to my new model, which is the necessary but not sufficient, sufficient but not necessary, neither necessary nor sufficient causalities, because you can actually have causal metrics that fit each of those buckets. But we'll we'll digress and come back to that. I want to go back to one semantic thing. You use the word sterile a lot. I'm very comfortable with it. I want to make sure the listener knows the difference between a sterile, a stanol, a zoosterol, a phytosterol. We're going to I think we're going to touch on this later. So let's just hammer out the semantics. Right. Well, Cholesterol, of course, is the molecule we all fear because it's been drummed into our head that cholesterol in a, an arterial wall is where, what is plaque. It's a cholesterol core, and that cholesterol can cause impaired vascular biology resulting in clinical events. So what is cholesterol? And we certainly, in Peter's notes here, you're going to have pictures of the cholesterol structure. And it's got four rings. It's an aromatic compound. And off the fifth ring is a little tail sticking out, which is a carbon chain. So the precursor molecule is called the stirring. So you have the the rings, the four rings, and you may or may not have this tail sticking off of the 17th carbon in the fourth ring. So all of the bonds are saturated. That is called the stirring. So if you unsaturated one double bond in that sterene. It's called the sterene. And if you then stick a hydroxy group on the third carbon in the first ring, it's called the sterol. It's an alcohol because you got a hydroxy group now sticking out. Hydroxy being OH. OH is Oxygen. hydroxy. Yeah. Excuse me. Correct. So you'll see the pictures in uh, my illustrated diagrams there. And that little tail that sticks out on the other end of the molecule has a lot to do with what exactly type of sterile that is and how it will function in a cell or in a cell membrane or so. So cholesterol would be this four-ring structure. Three of the rings have six carbons in it. The fourth ring has five carbons in it. You have this tail sticking off of carbon 17 that goes out. And in cholesterol, that's a totally saturated tail. Every bond in it is a, it's a saturated fatty acid. And then on the three position, you'd have this OH group, the hydroxy group. By the way, since OH is sort of soluble in water, that part of the cholesterol molecule is soluble in water, whereas that carbon chain sticking out, so pure lipid, that's all carbon, that's not soluble in water. So when cholesterol does exist in a surface membrane, like a cell membrane or lipoprotein, it's cholesterol. It orients itself. So the hydroxy group is sticking out and that allopathic tail is sticking into the core of the particle or so. Now the cholesterol, it's in the middle of the particle. Oh, the hydroxy group can't be in the middle of the particle. That's water. So they stick a really long chain fatty acid They replace the hydroxy group with a long chain, or really any chain fatty acid, but mostly it's a long chain. So you esterify cholesterol. Remember I told you, attaching a fatty acid to something is called esterify. So cholesterol, which is the active form of cholesterol that can be changed into a hormone, a bile salt, or function in a cell membrane, becomes a storage form of cholesterol or a lipid core transportable form of cholesterol called cholesterol. Now it's YL, it's not OL, ester. And we abbreviate that as CE. So free cholesterol is either going to be abbreviated as a C or an FC and cholesterol ester. And it's very difficult. If I wanted to, if I'm an adrenal gland and I got some cholesterol ester stored and I want to 
make a hormone because I need cholesterol. I have to deesterify that cholesterol ester to free cholesterol. If the liver has cholesterol ester storage pools and it does and it wants to make a bile acid, it has to deesterify cholesterol ester. Cholesterol is stored in huge quantities in fat cells as cholesterol ester, and it would have to be deesterified to be utilized to do something else or so. One little story I'll just tell before we get to the stanols and all the other stuff is one of my prouder moments in front of Bob Kaplan was when you sent an email, like this is a couple of months ago, you sent us an email and you said, see if you can spot the error in this figure. And it was like a figure that had a million things on it. And I was like, oh, I'm not getting up until I figure out where the mistake is. And sure enough, somewhere in there, it took me about 10 minutes. The illustrator had written, because this was out of a paper or something, they had written cholesterol, O L ester instead of cholesterol y l ester and 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 when i responded to you and you responded in the affirmative i was like i've got my stripes <laughs> <laughs> and that figure he's talking about came out of one of the productions for the company that i work for we develop educational pieces for physicians and i obviously drew it and labeled it but you send it off to a medical illustrator who formats it for the pdf or whatever and cholesterol's cholesterol, and they make the mistake. Even though I sent in the picture where it was properly labeled, of course, I had a heart attack the first time I saw it, and we've since changed that, but somehow Peter got a hold of an older version or something that probably even I sent out and didn't recognize initially. But yeah, so it is cholesterol ester. Anything that's esterified becomes a YL, so you'll see lipids. This discussion illustrates one of the challenges of lipidology, which is... I find this to be certainly among the two or three most complicated subject matters I've ever tried to master. And again, no one masters anything in life. I mean, that's sort of the beauty of this. You haven't mastered this. But this journey of trying to learn it, I am constantly humbled by how hard it is. It's just so goddamn complicated. Well, that's true, especially if you want to take it to the nth degree. But you need to invest yourself in some degree of education to at least be competent in today's uh, world or so. So you have to know some of this stuff. Well, and that's the thing. You have to be willing to learn some of this chemistry. I mean, you have to steep yourself in biochemistry and understand the because the significance becomes enormous. One double bond in one of these things completely changes its properties. And not to say that that's not true in general in biochemistry, but it's much easier to talk about blood pressure or to talk about elevated levels of uric acid or insulin or glucose without getting into that level of minutia. It is not possible to discuss and lipids without that. That is the problem with a lot of people are spouting off on the internet and elsewhere about all these, they just don't have an understanding of the complexity of all, how this all works and fits together and why what you just said is wrong because there's something going on stoichiometrically that you haven't even considered or, or, or so. To finish the sterol, so a steroid is a sterol that's got another keto group stuck on it someplace. Look at all the hormones. You'll yep. see a double bond with oxygen attached. But a stanol is you take, and let's take cholesterol as a stanol or a sterol. And remember, cholesterol, the third carbon's an OH group. There's a double bond at carbon 5 to 6 in the first ring, and then there's that tail at carbon 17. If I desaturated cholesterol, the double bond at C5 and 6 disappears, that's called cholesterol. It's a stanol. A stanol is essentially a saturated sterol. Changes the characteristics of that cholesterol, free cholesterol, can be readily absorbed in your intestinal walk. Stanols cannot be absorbed. And it's kind of funny, our liver to get rid of, or our body to get rid of cholesterol sends it to the liver. The liver sends it through the bile to the intestinal pool as free cholesterol. And your intestine is more than capable of just reabsorbing that cholesterol that the liver is trying to evict, except our little friendly microbes down there in the gut convert a ton of the biliary excreted cholesterol into a stanol called cholesterol. Or there's an isoform of it called coprostanol. It's a stanol, cannot be reabsorbed, so you poop it away. And that's how the body gets rid of cholesterol. It changes a lot of it to a stanol. Anthropologists have been measuring specimens for coprostanol. That tells them humans live there at one time because they find that in certain specimens and that human had to excrete it. You know, so uh, a stanol is simply a saturated. 
has other applications because, hey, if stanols cannot be absorbed, and I would like to have a metric of whether you're absorbing cholesterol or not, if I measured cholesterol in your blood, shouldn't be there to any appreciable degree because it tells you can't you absorb I'm, it. Yeah. If it is elevated in your blood, for whatever reason, and we now know why, your intestine just absorbed that cholesterol. And if it's absorbing cholesterol, which it tends not to, what is it absorbing in humongous excess cholesterol? So cholesterol serves as a biomarker of are you or are you not, or what degree of cholesterol absorption is going on in your intestines. And the last thing Peter did mention, he said phytosterols. He called it a zoosterol. I call it zoologies because I call it a zoosterol. So I don't know who's right on that. I'm going to go with you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to give you that. And I do have a degree in zoology when I went to college. You know, it was one of my majors. And, and you're wearing, just so everyone knows, you're wearing your Rutgers t-shirt right now as I well am. from college, which is perfect. All right. I wouldn't be here without the Earl Rutgers. That's medical school is inconsequential. I learned everything in Rutgers pre-med, at least the biochemistry and the physiology anyway. So phytosterols, look, plants are full of sterols. Their cell membranes are not cholesterol. Those, there are some plants that do have cholesterol in them. Most do not. But they have sterols that if I showed you, here's cholesterol and here's what's in this plant, you would think you're showing me a lot of cholesterol. But if you look closely, you'd see that tail that's coming out of carbon-17 is constructed a little differently. Or, wait a minute, there's another double bond in one of those rings in there. So it looks like cholesterol, but it's close, but it's really not. And since it was made in a plant, collectively, let's call them phytosterols. But we hopefully all eat a few vegetables during the day. So you're eating phytosterols, unless you're a total non, don't eat any vegetables. And they get in even in other things, even if you're eating shrimp and stuff, fish eat phy phytoplankton and stuff. So there's phytosterols in a bunch of foods. But your body knows the only sterol I need to function is cholesterol. I don't need any plant sterols. Why would I want a human to ever absorb the plant sterol? They would get in the way. Could they even be toxic, you know? So evolution must have figured out they were. So evolution made sure our intestine did not absorb phytosterols. Why? To me, it tells me there is a certain level at which phytosterols are toxic. Well, this becomes interesting because I had a disagreement with a physician recently who jointly takes care of one of my patients because the physician wanted to put this patient on phytosterol supplements Correct. because this physician became convinced that it was such an elegant way to lower cholesterol. It turns out about 10 to 15 percent of people in whom you give massive doses of phytosterols, you do indeed lower their cholesterol. This physician felt that was a good idea. I felt otherwise for reasons you'll explain, I'm sure. And needless to say, after a long discussion, we agreed to stop the phytosterols. Yes. And again, to me, the best argument with that is if your evolution thought we needed phytosterols, your intestine would be encouraged to absorb phytosterols. If somehow they brought some miraculous property to the human body that enhanced survival, you'd want them in there. And everybody think, oh, plants carry a lot of great stuff. We're only talking about the sterol that's in the plant, the phytosterol. Other ingredients in plants do get absorbed and probably are good for you. But not phytosterols. Well, there's data to show that phytosterols on a per molecule basis are probably more atherogenic than cholesterol. There certainly is that data there. But again, the people who are just so focused on lowering LDL cholesterol don't even entertain it, won't even look at it, or they dismiss it as nonsense, you know. And it's never going to be studied in the proper type of trial that you'd have to study it in, you know. So, and as Peter just hinted, if you're not a hyperabsorber of sterols, probably giving a phytosterol supplement is good because it does compete with cholesterol for, so you will absorb less cholesterol and maybe that's one way of lowering LDL cholesterol, but I would say who cares, but it, it, you would get a little bit of ApoB reduction in certain people with that. But if you're a hyperabsorber, I'm polluting your body with something that evolution didn't want in your body. Why would I do that? 
So I beg anybody who's a big advocate of supplementing phytosterols, please monitor phytosterols in the bloodstream. That's how you identify, oh my God, you're the one person I absolutely should not be giving this to. And I can send you a lot of data Peter's talking about showing you phytosterol toxicity in humans and stuff. So, And when we say someone's a hyper absorber, I mean, you and I have both written about this ad nauseum, so we'll link to it rather than get into a diatribe. But we're basically talking about, and your analogy is my favorite. I've always borrowed it, outright stole it. I Hopefully, I've always given you credit. You got a ticket taker yeah, in the bar. Neiman picks C1 like one transporter. He lets everybody in. If you can fit well, through the door. Yeah, he lets any sterile in. If you can fit through the door, you're coming in. But then you've got this ATP binding cassette G5, G8, and that's the bouncer. That's the enforcer. That's the one who, in theory, probably informed by LXR, is making some sort of decision about you're a good guy, you're a bad guy, you got to go, you got to stay. When someone is genetically a hyper absorber, is the quote unquote defect more on the the ticket taker or on the bouncer? turns out that it's both because now when we talk about absorption, let's face it, there's a million molecules that can be absorbed by your intestine. We're talking about sterile absorption right now. And cholesterol is a key ingredient for human life. So evolution not only gave every cell in your body the wherewithal to synthesize cholesterol, it allowed your intestine to absorb cholesterol because it certainly didn't want any cellular deficiency of cholesterol, which has nothing to do with plasma cholesterol, by the way. You can have an LDLC of three and have perfect cellular cholesterol metrics. So well, people as, don't as, understand as, that. As, as evidenced by the hypofunctioning PCSK9 <laughs> <Yes>. patients. <laughs> so... This Neiman pick C1 like protein in our proximal intestine recognizes sterols. And there's a sterol domain on there that binds tightly to sterols, but it binds most tightly to cholesterol because cholesterol has that structure. It has a less avid binding to a phytosterol, and it has minimal binding to a stanol. Now, ultimately, it'll bind to all of them, but cholesterol gets the first preference to be pulled into the enterocyte xenosterol, as I call it, rather than a phytosterol, xeno meaning other sterol, a sterol other than cholesterol, uh, would get in secondarily. And a stanol, they get in, but at much less concentrations. So now the enterocyte has this sterol you just absorb. Now the enterocyte's position is, I got to get this to the rest of the body. So I have to take this sterol and put it in a chylomicron that I'm going to make or I could also efflux any sterol out to a baby HDL that's looking for sterols. I can lipidate an HDL. So that's how sterols get out of the intestine. Or the intestine can say, we don't need any more sterols. I'm getting rid of you. And that's where the bouncer comes in. So these AT binding cassette transporters, ATP binding cassette transporters are a sterol efflux membrane transporter. So, And this is important to distinguish because, and again, it might be confusing, but the diagrams will make it easier. There's two effluxes you've referred to. There's an efflux on the luminal side and then an efflux back into the body. Both of them are leaving an enterocyte. One ends up leaving the body. If it goes out the ATP binding, because it's going into the lumen, it's being excreted with stool. If you efflux on the other side of the cell into either the chylomicron or into the HDL, you're actually putting it right back into circulation. And that is such a crucial point, Peter. I'm glad you elucidated on that more. So yeah, remember, we're talking about the enterocyte. Like the liver and enterocytes have a lot of things they can do with sterols. So they can get rid of it, or they can even use it. Remember, enterocytes have cell membranes. They need some cholesterol for their own cell membranes and everything. So they can ship it out. Hey, body needs cholesterol in a chylomicron. They can lipidate an HDL or they can return it to the lumen of the gut where it'll go out your rear end. So these ABC G5 or G8 transporters, as you're called, and it's a heterodimer, so you have one of each, will efflux, and they also have different affinities. So unlike the Neiman pick, which really wants cholesterol to come in, less so phytosterols and not so stanols, which tells me evolution didn't want those other products in your body. The ABC transformer or exporters, they, number one, evict phytosterols first. 
that's another evolutionary happenstance to me that tells me the body d- evolution didn't want phytosterols in your damn body because why is it giving you a phytosterol efflux protein in your intestine? And the liver has it too, just in case a phytosterol ever makes it as far as the liver. It gets evicted back to the bile or go back to your intestine. So second in line for exportation would be a stanol, and third would be cholesterol. So your ability to absorb cholesterol is a happy working relationship between the expression of your neiman pick c one like protein and your ABCG5GA transporters. So technically, if you even had a good normal degree of absorption, but you couldn't evict any sterols because you got a loss of function of an ABCG5 or G8, you're going to be a hyperabsorber because then the only way those sterols can get out of the enterocyte is in a collomicron or in an HDL. And by the way, when you do measure these phytosterols in the blood, people, it's like when you measure cholesterol in the blood. Do you understand? I've already told you where that cholesterol is. It's the cholesterol within all the lipoproteins. So if I'm measuring cytosterol, stigmasterol, campesterol, which are some of the names of the 50 phytosterols that are in our plant products, what am I measuring? Well, since the vast majority of lipoproteins are LDLs, I'm measuring LDL cytosterol, LDL cholesterol, like I'm measuring LDL cholesterol. So you're measuring there, but God forbid that particle invades an artery wall, the sterols go with it. And one last intriguing part of this story, which better put the fear of God of phytosterols into you, that evolution didn't want it in. So it gave you a protein that will not absorb phytosterols if it's working right. It gave you a protein that immediately evicts phytosterols. But for any sterile to go in a chylomicron, what does it have to be? Esterified. How does the intestine esterify cholesterol into cholesterol ester, which is what makes up a giant part of the core of a chylomicron? There's an esterifying enzyme, acyl cholesterol acyl transferase, ACAT. Guess what is the favorite ligand for ACAT? Cholesterol. Guess what is not a favorite ligand for ACAT? Phytosterols. So they... You just don't esterify phytosterol, which retards them getting into your body. And you know the real way to get in? That ABCA1 efflux transporter, which is what lipidates a baby HDL parto. It's not ABCG5, G8. Which right. Is ABCA1 exports sterols into baby HDL parto. And just for the listener, again, you're saying ABC. What you're saying is ATP binding cassette. So when they hear you say ABC, that's yeah. what you're referring it, it, to. It's yeah. an energy-driven process. So some of that phytosterols you're measuring in the blood are in HDL particles also. So that's a way to get in. And I always make, and look, you'd have to do a study and prove it, we're going to be talking about HDL dysfunction. Suppose I measured phytosterols in your HDL and it's very high. It's probably a type of dysfunctional HDL particle, you know? So there's all sorts of intriguing. It would also, you know, not to get too esoteric, but that would also suggest enterocyte dysfunction because the enterocyte should also, quote unquote, know better that that's not the direction of efflux I want. It is, but... It's relying on the ABC G5, G8 to efflux it. Then it wouldn't even get to an ABC A1 to efflux it on the other side. And ACAT is not going to sterify it if it's all being evicted. There would be very little that would wind up being a sterified. And the last part of this puzzle, as Peter told you, have a gut lumen side and you got a plasma side or a lymphatic side, which is where colomicrons exit. We probably talk about it somewhere today is this crazy process they used to call reverse cholesterol transport, which is another one of these idiotic terms that should have disappeared a long time ago, at least if you think it's mediated by solely by HDL, high-density lipoproteins. That's the part that's got to change. A big pathway of how does the body get rid of cholesterol, we're all taught, oh, it brought it back to the liver, and the liver will get rid of it in a certain way. Guess what? A ton of it is just brought directly right back to the intestine, and the cholesterol in the particle or the particle itself finds its way into the enterocyte through the, and then the enterocyte has another supply of sterols all of a sudden that it didn't absorb. And so what? It then will do with that sterol what it wants. It can efflux it through ABCG5, G8 into your gut lumen and you can poop it away. So the process of a lipoprotein or some other trafficker, albumin, red blood cells, bringing cholesterol back to the small intestine, bypassing the liver, 
gets right out into your stool is called transintestinal cholesterol efflux, abbreviated as TICE, and it's a major reverse cholesterol transport pathway now. Do we have a sense, because we're going to talk about direct and indirect RCT in a moment, I think that might as well, this is as good a, a foray into that as any. Do you have a sense of how much cholesterol is being reverse transported, so to speak, through TICE versus the t- sum total of direct and non-direct reverse cholesterol transport? Yeah, this has been studied even dynamically, but you know, they're real small studies and it probably varies individually depending on the complexity of your lipid and lipoprotein transportation systems or so. Some pe- in some people it's probably 20% and in other people it's, it's been reported as high as 60%. Wow. So it varies a lot, but it's a major player. It's not this infinitesimal minor baby pathway that's inconsequential except in some rat in a laboratory or something. It's This has been proven in humans now. There, I just read part of the review process and a really cool article coming out in the journal of clinical lipidology where because of some biliary surgery the guy had the only way cholesterol gets out of this person's body was through the intestine and they did these <laughs> so it shows you the how body many, can get rid of cholesterol without a biliary system how many articles do you review a year there's two things when you're an associate editor the main editor will say here here's a submitted paper do you think this is pretty good? If so, send it out to four or five reviewers. They will send their review to you, and then you make your decision and send it to me, and I'll make the ultimate decision. But then also, I'm also just a reviewer, yep. where another associate editor would say, I think Tom knows a lot about this subject, so I'll ask him, would he please review this article to me? So uh, I don't know. I probably get about 15 articles a year where I'm the associate editor and probably double that where... You're one and, of the reviewers. And, and, or just one of several reviewers or so. But that's still about and, and, 50 papers a year that yeah, are coming across and your I desk. I am blessed at my stage of the game to have a job where I do have, I don't have to see patients anymore. I'm not traveling throughout the United States a hundred times a, a year on flights doing lectures here, there, and everywhere. So I am blessed in my current position or my true health diagnostic, uh, Peter probably when you hear this the first time, you'll get a list of my uh, who I work for and who I don't. That's the only company I work for nowadays, and I'm their uh, scientific academic advisor. So my job is to stay on top of the literature, know all this stuff, and explain it. So I have the freedom every day to spend time reading and educating. And part of my education, anybody who's a reviewer or an editor with us, you'll learn a lot doing that because I get... I don't know everything that's sent to me for review, but I'll sure as heck know where to go and get it. Well, there's a small study. group of us that are very lucky. We're having dinner with Jamie Underberg tonight, but, you know, Jamie, Seth, there's like this group of like 10 people that you always send out the most interesting papers to. And about a year ago, I had forwarded a number of these on to Bob Kaplan, and he was like, hey, can you put me on this email too? And I, I mean, we have to think about a way to, for, for you to create a special group where, because it, it strikes me that there's a broader group of people who would actually like to get the once a week email from Tom with the most interesting lipid paper I've read this week. Yeah, I think the best way of doing that is uh, somehow contacting me at Dr. Lipid or so. Uh, I mean, you put a lot of this stuff out on Twitter, yeah, too. Yeah, I, I do, so you can research it. And- but you don't get the commentary because your emails are sometimes so great. Because what you'll do is you'll say, look, I know all of you aren't going to read this 12-page paper. Here's like a 300-word summary of what you would learn. And then that, like for me to read that, then open the paper, it's like, it's quick. And it's just the... Number one, I really don't want to get, I don't know how many people listen to Peter's podcast, but it's immense. I don't want 4,000 emails tomorrow saying, put me on your email. And there's two things as part of that email. One would be my interpretation of something, which is fine. That's Day Springs opinion. No, but when we can, we can. I, I can't attach PDFs to it that I might to an isolated friend yeah, because yeah. of copyrights and yeah, things yeah, like that's, that. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's so, part of the bigger so issue. That, that's part of an issue also. So if it's open access, great. And if it is, I've probably tweeted it and your best bet. And look, people maybe, aren't maybe. afraid to ask me questions. I mean, a lot of them are asinine and I ignore them. But I will answer it. My Twitter followers know you're legitimate and I'll, I'll either direct message you. Or, yeah, yeah. Uh, All right. So and back if to I this. don't, then uh, there's a reason. Okay, so let's get back to the business of, of lipids here. So we've done a pretty good job explaining 
one side of the equation at how cholesterol oh, is regulated. A, a zoosterol would be cholesterol. It's the only sterol we, the animal kingdom produces. Yes. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Cholesterol yeah. is the zoosterol. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the other end of this regulatory pathway. So we've described the reabsorption side pretty well. There's a synthetic side, which you've alluded to, obviously, by making the statements that, hey, every cell in the body can make cholesterol, and most of the time, it's sufficient for its needs. Obviously, exceptions, well, we'll I'll, I'll let you explain what the exceptions are to that. There are a certain scenarios and certain cells where they actually do need cholesterol from other tissues. But let's just go back to this synthetic stuff, just briefly, because I don't want to give anybody too much headache. How do we make cholesterol? Very complexly, it's a uh, multi-stage process, 20 to 30 individual steps where one molecule is changing into another, into another, and at the end of the day, cholesterol is made. And it starts very small. It's basically it's acetyl-CoA, a, acetyl-CoA. It really acetyl-CoA. It's, it's two carbon, two carbon. It's a very carbon chain molecule that keeps growing in length because cholesterol has 37 carbons in it. So it has to grow. Through much of that growth, it's just a linear structure. And at a certain point, this linear structure is long enough that it bends and changes into a sterol configuration, lanosterol being the first sterol that appears in the cholesterol synthesis chain. By the way, if I wanted a lab, and labs with liquid chromatography and mass spec could give you a lanocost, a lanoc- a uh, sterile measurement, and if it was up, hey, you're over-synthesizing cholesterol. That's not the one they focus on. They pick a more downstream a cholesterol precursor to do that. But even you could pick some of the earlier ones, and they do serve as markers of cholesterol synthesis, you know. Now, the cholesterol synthetic pathway is bifurcated. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so once you go through squalene, and, and then that bends into a ring structure, linosterol has to become cholesterol. So linosterol, and there's crosstalk between the pathways, but it has one or two pathways that it's going to go down. And at the end of the day, both pathways, you'll wind up with cholesterol. And no good pathways don't come with names. So they these, do. what are these <laughs> names of these pathways? Uh, yeah, Mr. Facetious here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, my favorite, of course, is the block pathway. Because <laughs> if you die, and I put a lot, he was a Twitter picture I had put up recently. He won the Nobel Prize for discovering this pathway in cholesterol. So it's probably important. They give you a Nobel Prize for discovering this pathway of cholesterol synthesis. So the block pathway would be lenosterol goes through a lot of precursors and becomes something called desmosterol, D-E-S-M-O-S-T-E-R-O-L. Desmosterol looks exactly like cholesterol, except in carbon-24, there's a double bond. There's no double bonds in that tail that's on the cholesterol molecule. So if I just saturate that double bond in desmosterol, I change it into cholesterol. And of course, there's a specific enzyme that does that. If you inhibit Can I guess it? (laughs) Yes. So this is just so people can understand what these enzymes mean. So I remember learning this in, in college. All right. So, or med school, not college. Enzymes always end in ACE, right? Now, you just told me it was carbon-24. So it's it's probably going to have something to have. It's going to have a 24 in there. It will. And we often throw deltas into these things because delta denotes the position of the bond. And did you say that desmosterol has a double bond at right. 24 and it has to be saturated. saturated? So it would probably be something like a delta-24 saturase or desaturase. Correct. All right. So that would be the enzyme. So when you say that, when you rattle that off, it sounds crazy and intimidating, but it's logical, right? It is. And this is why what you were talking about before, you really have to notice stuff or you might not be. And the presence or the expression or the lack of expression of that enzyme is going to, are you going to use that pathway? If you're using that and you don't convert desmosterol into cholesterol, you're going to have a lot of desmosterol in your system. Are there consequences to that? There's a human disease called desmosterolosis that if it occurs in utero, that kid ain't coming out alive. Or if he does, he ain't living for more than a few days. And is that disease a genetic deficiency in the enzyme, Delta-2040 saturase? It is, yeah. yeah. Now, there's another pathway, lenosterol doesn't. And what determines sort of is if you've got a double bond at that 24, it's going to go through that pathway. Now, there's a, a lenosterol 
has another pathway that goes through that's going to wind up with cholesterol. And the pre-cholesterol, the penultimate, as we call it, the next to the last cholesterol molecule in that chain is something called lethosterol. Some people call it lethosterol. I call it lethosterol, L-A-T-H-O, sterol. And that is called the Can dutch russell pathway, obviously after the guys who discovered that. By the way, they didn't get the Nobel Prize for some reason, even though that was... <laughs> I think the Nobel <laughs> Committee said we already gave one of these things out. And also, that you can only have three people receive a Nobel Prize. Uh, oh, so that would be two. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So whatever. Everybody else, I guess, who worked in Block's lab got no credit. So. But anyway, uh, so it's the Can dutch russell pathway. So, and it's kind of interesting because in most people, both pathways exist. And there are some ways of jumping from one pathway to another. So at the end of the day, you're going to make cholesterol or so. But if you want to start interfering with these pathways, there are specific enzymes in each pathway that maybe that's would be something you could play with. Or maybe if you're building too much of something, there's a lack of expression of that enzyme in you, which maybe has consequences, maybe it doesn't. So it's all important to know. But some of this may be tissue specific. One of the things I know it's a big topic of yours, and I hope we get into today is the brain. Everything I've talked about cholesterol today that we're measuring in the blood has zero to do with cholesterol in the brain. Cholesterol, lipidology in the brain is, might as well be in another different body. It has nothing to do with what the cholesterol is going on in the rest of your body. The brain makes every cholesterol molecule it needs, and therefore... There are no LDL particles delivering cholesterol to your brain. So again, if with super and, aggressive and, and therapies... And to be clear, this is because the LDL particle just doesn't fit through the blood-brain barrier. Correct. Even HDLs, where a little bit of their cholesterol might get into it, it's delipidated through these ABC things, and some of that might work its way into inconsequential amount. The ApoB is, I guess, too big. The brain doesn't make ApoB, so, but the central nervous system has to traffic lipids from brain cells to peripheral nerve cells. ApoE is the uh, protein transporter in the brain. So cholesterol or any sterol is attached to ApoE in the brain, and that's how it, tra it traffics around there. So, And again, it hasn't got nothing to do with the ApoE that's involved with whatever lipoproteins are doing in your the rest of your body also. So just understand it. But obviously I, I want to come this is such an important topic that I absolutely want to come back to it. So I'm glad you brought it up. But that said, at the moment I would love to go back to the synthetic stuff. Correct. So you've got each cell in the body can basically start with the most simple carbon subunit, which is a two carbon subunit, acetyl CoA, and through a process of carbon fixation go on to make these very complicated four carb four ringed structures they first and foremost the cell uses these things they make the, yeah. the, the important part of the cell membrane and if, or, if anyone, organelle membranes and depository that's right so everything yeah. from the golgi right. apparatus to the er to the smooth er rough er etc you also you don't have to be i think a biochemist to look at a picture of a molecule like cortisol estrogen, testosterone. And I think you could show a four-year-old a picture of those and then a molecule of cholesterol. And they would be like, hey, those look similar. Yeah. It's like maybe I look like my mother and father. Or they, uh, did they have a, an origin or did they come from that? So sure. So certain cells can certainly transform cholesterol into reproductive hormones or adrenocortical hormones. Certain cells, hepatocytes, can transform cholesterol into a bile acid I don't think there's any other cell that can change cholesterol into anything else. So when people talk about cholesterol metabolism, there is no cholesterol metabolism. It can be converted into something in specific tissues, but it can be excreted. That's it. There's no other way your body can handle so do we? Is there any evidence that we use cholesterol for energy? Zero. Why? There's no energy is really coming out of the saturated the fats that have the most no double bonds that's the most they're carrying the most atp cholesterol is not producing energy cholesterol cannot be metabolized and produce atp in the process i mean to me that's the bigger issue yeah. right i think so, so some people get confused about this it's not that there isn't energy in a carbon carbon bond or a carbon hydrogen bond because that's exactly what's being liberated in the metabolism of a fatty acid the point is we don't have the enzymatic machinery to undergo 
the chemical process of breaking down those bonds and liberating the chemical energy into electrical energy. Can't metabolize cholesterol. Cholesterol ester, which carries that fat as can be deesterified, but your cells aren't making cholesterol ester. The liver is, the intestine is, but the adipocytes are. But My hypothesis for why that's the case, which could be entirely bullshit and I'm just making it up, but it, that's, that's what hypotheses are, they're guesses, is that it would have been evolutionarily dangerous if we could have metabolized cholesterol. Because in periods of fasting, which we all did evolutionarily, the last thing you want your body doing is going after cell membranes and hormones as a source of energy. So I think it's actually a very deliberate design, quote, I use design in quotes, to say, hey, no matter what, your cholesterol and your hormones are off limits during starvation. And instead, we evolved this other remarkable pathway of ketosis, which takes an ample substrate of fats and goes down the path of metabolizing those and actually saving our muscle from the catabolic destruction that we would undergo if we couldn't undergo ketosis. This is the brilliance of Peter Atiyah to me, that he can come up with what sounds <laughs> like know. a super plausible thing. See, I'm not smart enough to It could be entirely bullshit. So I can it... tell you how to sell God cholesterol, what it can do with it, but he's figured out what sounds like a really plausible reason. And everybody's so worried about depleting cholesterol in the plasma as measured by LDL cholesterol, which has nothing to do with anything, because actually there's more cholesterol in your red blood cells than there are in lipoproteins. Yes. And you're not making that zero by any means by using lipid drugs or something. So, But you can't deplete a cell of cholesterol beyond a certain amount. So you're going to screw up cellular function. And you can't put too much cholesterol in that cell because it'll crystallize and kill that cell. So... That's why it's so tightly regulated, synthesis, influx, and efflux. Now, are there cells under certain circumstances, for whatever reason, can't make enough cholesterol? Yeah, there, there are pediatric disorders where if you don't synthesize cholesterol, things happen to you in utero. And- well, the other thing we see this in, and I, didn't, I don't even know why I started noticing this, but this is one of the things I used to do in residency that used to kind of piss off some of the attendings, is I would do little experiments. And it was always a measurement experiment. So it wasn't like I was putting a patient at risk other than they, a few more milliliters of blood were being drawn. But I remember once happening on, an, on a finding, which was maybe by accident, I had checked a, a lipid panel on a patient in the ICU. And I saw something interesting and I kept rechecking it in other patients over and over again. And I kept seeing this, which was anytime a patient was having a SIRS response, that's capital S-I-R-S, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So this is the Vaso, you know, metabolic response to sepsis, infection, trauma, you name it. Enormous drop in HDL cholesterol. And I think we could look at that today and say it's very likely that what we were seeing was in that period of profound physiologic stress, the body is greatly ramping up its hormone production, glucocorticoids and, and others. And that would be one of the situations where Cells were actually, you know, HDL was now delivering cholesterol to the adrenal glands in a period of, you know, because that's about the most physiologically stressful thing that an organism can respond to. Again, I don't know if that's been documented, but it seems to me pretty logical that that would be a, at least the most plausible explanation for why HDL could plummet in patients who are going through that degree of stress. Yes. And by the way, it's the reason you never do an lipid profile in an acute yeah, yeah, situation yeah. because... A lot of lipids are going to be transiently changed or so here. But Peter's right. We know this for a lot of reasons. Clearly, the steroidogenic tissues need cholesterol to make their steroid hormones, be they reproductive organs or your adrenal cortex. And in the situations Peter's talking about, uh, cortisone is a pretty useful hormone to have around or other mineralocorticoids and things like that are so. So clearly... The, those organs, those tissues are going to need a lot of cholesterol pools to make all that. So they, they turn up their synthesis rates, so they make a lot of cholesterol. But they would also tune up their, hey, let's gather some exogenous cholesterol, so to speak. So those cells would upregulate LDL receptors. And that's a case where there's a tissue that might, under certain circumstances, pull in LDL particles full of cholesterol ester, they would deesterify it and use it. But in a physiologic person who's not in one of these acute situations, the adrenal gland most of the time just makes all the cholesterol it needs. But if it needs a secondary source, 
that's why you have HDLs. HDLs have a half-life of five days. One of the reasons they circulate for five days is it's a floating plasma reservoir of cholesterol for tissues that might actually need cholesterol. Now, my nose cell that I talked about before doesn't need HDLs or anybody else to deliver cholesterol to it. No other cell does except those steroidogenic tissues. In other words, to be really clear and specific, you're sloughing off endothelial cells in your nose every day. Well, you have to replace them. The lion's share of the cholesterol requirement is to make a cell membrane. It's just, it has the machinery. It has the machinery within the nucleus to produce that just as it's producing other structural proteins. Right. So, uh, and this is what... People just translate low cholesterol plasma measurements to think you're screwing up cells throughout the body, and you're not. (laughs) Yeah, this is one of the challenges that I've never come up with a great way to explain this idea of flux, which is you do a lipid measurement at a moment in time, you're getting a snapshot of what's in the plasma at a moment in time, which doesn't give you two pieces of information. How is it changing over time, and what's the movement or the velocity? And secondly, it gives you no insight into what's happening in the cell, or what's happening in the endothelium for that matter. And instead, that's the nature of lipidology is you have to be able to extrapolate to these other things by indirect measurements. It gives you zero insight. The only usability of plasma measurements are as surrogates of lipoprotein defining whether you have ApoB, ApoA1 particles. And we know too many ApoB particles. You're over time at big risk, at increased risk for atherosclerotic disease or events otherwise why even measuring lipids in the plasma it tells you nothing and what we're talking about you call it influx efflux and that nails it down but it's cholesterol homeostasis or sterile homeostasis and your body has evolved a lot of ways to do interesting too and say that a crisis is going on adrenal needs continued it's not just hey you're you cured yourself in 12 hours overnight, you survived whatever. And if that catastrophic process was ongoing, HDLs eventually would run out of cholesterol. You just said your HDL cholesterol level is plummeting and that's been documented many times. So the HDL all of a sudden has to go back and start grabbing cholesterol molecules from some other tissue and get it to the steroidogenic tissue. And the number mega place where HDLs get most of their lipidation is it goes right back to the liver and gets lipidated or what is the biggest cholesterol storage organ in the body not the liver your adipocytes everybody thinks adipocytes are just storing triglycerides they're a massive storage organ so baby HDLs that are depleted they run back to the adipocytes which express this ABCA1 transporter that pumps out all their cholesterol to an HDL which boom right back to the adrenal gland bounces back and forth like a ping pong ball. You can find all of this information and more at peteratiamd.com forward slash podcast. There you'll find the show notes, readings, and links related to this episode. You can also find my blog and the Nerd Safari at peteratiamd.com. What's a Nerd Safari, you ask? Just click on the link at the top of the site to learn more. Maybe the simplest thing to do is to sign up for my subjectively non-lame once-a-week email where I'll update you on what I've been up to, the most interesting papers I've read, and all things related to longevity, science, performance, sleep, etc. On social, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all with the ID Peter Atia, MD. But usually Twitter is the best way to reach me to share your questions and comments. Now for the obligatory disclaimer. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional health care services, including the giving of medical advice. And note, no doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to the podcast is at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnoses, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice for any medical condition they have and should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures, the companies I invest in and or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about. <laughs>